Good morning. Hey, come on. Welcome to Gwen's Island. This morning we're going to begin with a servant of all. It's based on what Jesus said. That the greatest are those who serve. If you want to be great in God's kingdom. Great to see you this morning. Let's start this morning with prayer and uh, remember also those with COVID, um, a lot of them in the community. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the sunshine again. Thank you that it's a symbol for us that you shine in our lives, that you're the light of the world. We just thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for power to say no to sin. And we thank you for people that gather together in your name to make a statement that we love you and we honor you and we serve you. And now move in our midst. You know what each one of us here needs to hear this morning. Open our ears to hear specifically for ourselves what you're speaking to each one of us. And we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Next will be you are my all in all. That's really what the word or the phrase of the early Christians was Jesus is Lord. And that's what it meant. You're my all in all. You're my everything. Congregation.
Thank you. At this point, we're going to have special music, first of all, by Catherine Murphy. And she's brought her ukulele. My fears were drowned in perfect 
a slave to fear I am a child of God Wasn't that great? Yes, it was. This is Autumn Jenkins singing for those tears I died.
to be surrounded by such talent. Today I want to start off with something I got in an email this week. And uh, it's a story about a visiting pastor who attended men's breakfast in the middle of a rural farming area in the country. And the group had asked an old farmer decked out in his bib overalls to say grace for the morning breakfast. So the farmer stood up and prayed, Lord, I hate buttermilk. The visiting pastor opened one eye, glanced at the farmer and wondered where he was going with this. Then the farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was growing concerned. Without missing a beat, the farmer continued and said, Lord, you know, I don't care much for raw white flour either. The pastor once again opened an eye and glanced around the room and saw that there were others having concerns. Then the pastor added, but Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them up, I sure do love warm, fresh biscuits out of the oven. So Lord, when things come up that we don't like, when life gets hard, when we don't understand what you're saying to us, help us to just relax and wait for you until you're done mixing and baking. It will probably be something even better than biscuits. Amen. That kind of ties in with this morning's message. Um, title of the message is Delayed for Purpose. Got to get my pliers here. It's my paper holder. delayed for a purpose and and basically the setting is Lazarus and uh, it's the healing of Lazarus or the resurrection of Lazarus really the original setting was in Bethany which means house of dates or house of misery depends on which language you're translating it from it was a village about two miles outside of Jerusalem in the Mount of Olives Mary and Martha and Lazarus are the participants, the major ones. They were siblings, brothers and sisters. This Mary was the one that wiped Jesus' feet with her hair, washed him with her tears, and anointed his head with oil. Jesus and his disciples were a second participant. They had all left Jesus and the disciples had left Judea because the Pharisees were trying to kill him. So they left and they went down across the Jordan River beyond Jordan. That was it's one of my favorite puns, you know. Everything's beyond Jordan. If you have a name like Jordan, it kind of makes it funny. The other is the Pharisees. They were part of the participants. They opposed Jesus in anything he said or did. And then there was the crowd of undecided people. They were following Jesus, trying to decide whether he, he was really the Messiah. So that's all the background stuff. In verse 3 in John chapter 11, we read, let me read these passages. Um, we're going to read John 3, 11, 3 through 7, 24 through 26, 40 through 44. It's in your program. 
So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When, we heard, when he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and Mary and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stared, stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Isn't that kind of sarcasm? He loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So he stayed two more days instead of going to heal. That's where we get the title of the sermon, Delayed for a Purpose. Verses 24 and 25, Jesus was talking with Martha. She'd come out to talk with him about it. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then skipping to verse 40 and following. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you, you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. And I said this for the benefit of the crowd who's watching. That they may know and believe that you sent me. And when Jesus said this, he called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Uh, so most preachers would say that'll preach. So we're gonna look real quickly at several things in this passage. First of all, and priority, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and they loved him. And that runs all the way through this. When Jesus hears, it's because he loved them. Martha and Mary sent word for him to come rescue Lazarus, heal him, because they loved him and they loved Jesus. And they knew Jesus loved Lazarus because they said, the disciple you love, Lazarus, is sick. Come and heal him. So running through this whole thing is God's love. And whatever you're facing today, you need to get that nailed down. God loves you. Jesus loves you. And whatever he's doing, however he's doing it in your life, it's because he loves you. And if he's not answering the, qu the prayers just like that, if he's delaying, it's because he loves you. If he answers them just like that, it's because he loves you. All the way through, it doesn't matter what happens in your life, never doubt that Jesus loves you. Because that's the truth. And that will get you through anything and everything. Jesus loved Mary and Martha. Jesus made all of his decisions and actions from a motive of love. He still does. When Jesus does something, it's out of love. And the way Jesus does something, it's out of love. And when he does something, it's out of love. His motive is always love for God and love for you. And that, again, can get lost when you start feeling miserable and you start feeling self-pity and you start wondering why the bad things always happen to me and you know all those things we feel and think when bad things happen to us. Never forget that Jesus loves you. In three through six, we read that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. There's very few places in the New Testament where it specifically says Jesus loved a specific person. We know that he loved the disciples. We know that he loves us. God so loved the world that Jesus came 
and died for us. We know that. But very few times does it say, now Jesus loved this person. There are times when he did. And those are significant times. It doesn't mean he didn't love the rest of us. It's pointing out that what he was doing is because he loved them. Loving someone is not based upon the person's goodness or merit. God did not, never loved us because we were so perfect. He never loved us because we were so much fun to be around. He never loved us because we had so much potential. He loved us because he loved us. He loved us because we're us and we're unique. And he created us and we're valuable. That's how Jesus love. He loves his enemies. He loves his friends. He loves those who reject him and he loves those who accept him. The consequences are different, perhaps, but he loves us. Upon hearing of Lazarus dying, instead of rushing off to heal him before he died, Jesus said, hey, let's wait two more days. Why did he do that? Because he had a bigger agenda than healing. Jesus had already healed tons of people. Just last week, he had healed the blind man, born blind from death, from birth, and, and he healed him. All through the scriptures, he healed people. He healed people. And people already knew he could heal people. That's why they were sending for Jesus. He can heal people. But he had a bigger agenda. Because God is not just about keeping us physically healthy for the rest of our lives in this sinful body. That, you know, some people say, why is there death? And the reason there's death, because death is the only way for this sinful body to die. <laughs> and if there were no death, then we would live eternity in a sinful body. And that would be hell, not heaven. And so God was going to show that the physical life dies, but when you entrust your life to Jesus, the spiritual life, who you are as a person, and the resurrection life, you live on. You live on, but now you don't have the sinful body anymore. And the glory of God is that death is not the end. It's a trans transference point. It's like going to the airport and you got on one plane and then it stops and you have to get on another plane. It's the way you transfer from this city to the heavenly city, from this world to the eternal world. It's a transfer point. Upon hearing that Lazarus was dying, instead of rushing off to heal him, Jesus waited the two more days in Bethany. And then he said to the disciples, okay, let's go. And the disciples resisted. They said, Lord, they just tried to kill you up there, and you're going to go back? They tried to kill you, stone you. And you're going to go right back there and make yourself vulnerable to that again? Well, that's what love does, doesn't it? It makes itself vulnerable. It takes a risk to love somebody. That's what love does. Love always does what it needs to do, but it doesn't always do it the way we want it to be done. You know, your parents always came through in their love for you, but they didn't always do it on your time or in the way you wanted them to do it. But the whole time, it was love. It was love. You know, they didn't give you the BB gun because you chewed your eye out. You know? <laughs> but then later they gave it to you when you were more capable of handling it. And so love does that. 
It doesn't always do it the way you want it to be done. God doesn't always do things our way either. Mary and Martha had wanted Jesus to come before Lazarus died. And Jesus waited two days and then two more days the trip there. So four days. Why did he do that? Probably because it makes it more of a miracle. That he was going to die. Remember when he gets down there and he goes to the tomb and he's going to say, hey, open up the tomb. And what does Martha say? Lord, it's been four days. He stinketh. <laughs> Don't open it up. It's going to stink. <laughs> Jesus wanted them to know Lazarus was really dead. And all the people knew Lazarus was really dead. He didn't just fall asleep. Jesus' terminology about falling asleep was a metaphor for dying. People needed to know he was really, really dead. That it wasn't just a healing. And when Jesus called him out of the tomb, they realized he is the resurrection and the life. That Jesus has done what no one else can do. He has defeated death. And it was a foreshadow of what Jesus was going to do. He was in the tomb three days and came out. And when he came out, he had a different body. When he came out, he had a body that could pass through walls. And he could be there, eat, you could touch him, but then instantaneously could go through a wall, leave. That brought glory to God. It moved it up a notch. Not only can God heal, God can resurrect. God can bring the dead back to life. Secondly, timing is important in life. Don't forget that everything Jesus does is out of life. He waits two more days and then comes. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. He's died. Let's go awaken him. He came to rise us, raise us up out of the grip of sin and to release us from the power of fear and death. You see, every one of us will die physically. And there will come a time when the doctor can't heal you. We all die. But because of Jesus, all who believe in him live, even though we die. And that's to the glory of God. And that's the message of Easter. That's the message of the resurrection. That's the message of Jesus. That God loved us so much that he didn't just let us die and disappear. He came to save us, to forgive us, to change us, to bring us into his presence, and to be, let us live with him forever, where there will be no more death, no more tears, no more crying, no more sorrow, and no sinful body. Timing is important. Jesus is presently and eternally the resurrection and then the life he believes, who believes in him, will live. And then he asks you the question, do you believe it? Because that's what you need to do. You need to believe Jesus. Thirdly, there's the if onlys. Lord, if only you had been here. Jesus shows up. The disciples are with him. The Pharisees are there. And they're already watching him and looking how they can trap him. And Jesus goes anyway. And he goes, and as he approaches, they say, Jesus is coming. And Martha runs out to meet him. And she says this, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now that says two things. First of all, it says she has regrets. She's a human. She just lost her brother, whom she loved. And she's saying, you know, I love my brother, and if you had been here, he would not have died. It's not blaming Jesus. It could have been, but he really wasn't, she wasn't blaming Jesus. 
She was stating a fact. Jesus, you've healed people all through your ministry. If you'd been here, my brother would have lived. So she didn't understand her brother dying. If only. What would be the blanks that you would fill in? The things that happened that really grieved you and, and really uh, upset your faith in Jesus. That you would fill in the blanks. Lord, if, you, if only you'd done this or if only you'd showed up earlier or if only this or if only that. We all have them. But in reality, we also have, thank God, you did this. Thank God you showed up. Thank God, thank God, thank God. So we have our if onlys and we have our thank gods. All of us have those times. She was express, expressing grief and remorse, but she was also expressing faith. Think about it. She was saying, Lord, if you had been here, if only you had been here, if only you'd arrived four days earlier, if only you'd arrived two days earlier. But no, it was four days. He had already been two, four days. She was expressing faith that you had the power to heal him. She was also expressing grief. I lost my brother. Oh, if only you could have come sooner. Then the scene switches to Mary. Mary came to Jesus, fell at his feet weeping, saying, Lord, if only you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. What a great statement. In a sense, there's some insight there because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And if he's here, you will not die. Your body may die, but you live on with Christ in eternity. She was full of remorse and grief, 1132. She was full of love and faith, 1132. She was full of if only, recognizing the loss she experienced, but also the power of God. Lastly, and a lot of people say, you know what a sermon, when a preacher says lastly, what does it mean? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> he doesn't, he's still got stuff to say. The last point we want to look at is experiencing God's glory and goodness. 11, 40 through 44. Jesus comes, he interacts with Mar Martha, he interacts with Mary, and then he says, where's the tomb? Where's Lazarus? And so they take him to the tomb. And Jesus did the shortest verse in the Bible. It says, Jesus wept. And the Pharisees, are, people are watching and they're going, oh, how he loved him. Look at that. Jesus loved Lazarus and he's grieving and he's crying because he loves Lazarus. And that's also true, just in a different way than we think. You see, Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the grave. So why would he be crying? He was crying because he was going to raise Lazarus from the grave. <laughs> think about it a minute. Where had Lazarus been? If you believe as Paul believed, that the moment you die, you go into the presence of God and the beauty of heaven and the sinlessness of eternity and the beauty and the joy and the magnificence of, of God's everything he could ever create that didn't have any decay in it and no hatred no backbiting, no pity, pity, pettiness, just great laughter, joy, love, appreciation for one another.
that's where Lazarus was. And Jesus was going to raise him out of that and bring him back to this hellhole. Because compared to heaven, this is not so great a place. And Jesus knew that Lazarus, when he came back, was going to be a threat to the Pharisees. And the rest of the book talks about them plotting how to kill Lazarus. So it's a miracle that he brought him back, but he wept because he knew what Zach, uh, Lazarus was going to face. Regardless, he tells him to remove the stone. The stone was what stood between Lazarus and Jesus, so to speak stood between death and life. And Jesus says, remove it. And he does that all through our lives. He removes barriers that stand between us and God. Get him out of the way so that you're open to God, open interaction with God. Second thing he said, so we need to do that too. We need to remove what stands between us and God. Secondly, believe that what Jesus says and what he has promised. For Mary it was, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. I am the life. He that believes in me, though he dies, yet will he live. Believe it. A lot of your fears will go away. A lot of your stress will go away. Because Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Prayer of Thanksgiving. Jesus was so confident that Lazarus was going to come out of the tomb, he prays and thanks God that he's already heard him. Faith already believes that it's existence, you know. Believes that things are that are unseen are seen and are real. Hebrews 11, 7, 11, 6 says we must believe that God is and that He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. So Jesus prays this prayer outside out loud, and all the people are listening. And Jesus says, "You know, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me, but I'm saying this for these folks' sake." so that they know you always hear me. And then he commands, Lazarus, come out. And you've got to be realistic here. <laughs> Lazarus is wrapped in grave cloths. So probably he hopped out. You know, it was probably... He's got grave cloths wrapped around his whole body. Too many of us are Christians who have come alive in Christ, but we're still wrapped up in the old life of death. And some of the things that have wrapped us up have been there for a long time, and it takes a long time to get them cut off sometimes. It's, when you become a Christian, it's an instantaneous thing. You pass from darkness into light. You pass from death into eternal life. You, the moment you say, Jesus, I need you, I give, my, give you my life, thank you for dying for me, forgive me, cleanse me. The moment you pray that, poof, you're a new person in Christ. But you know what? You still got all these death cloths wrapped around you that have been wrapped around you for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And so many of us like the, the abundant life. You know, we have life, but we don't have it abundant. We know that when we die, we go to heaven, but we have no idea. It's the cheese and cracker thing. And I didn't tell you that story before, so allow me to tell you this story. There was a man, an immigrant, who wanted to come to America it was the time when everybody was coming to America. It was the land of promise. And so you wanted to come. You wanted to come. And so this guy had saved up money because it was expensive to come. 
and he saved up money and saved up money and he finally had enough money for a berth on a boat a ship I guess you would say and so he gets on this ocean liner and he had enough money for the ticket and then he bought cheese and crackers that would last the two weeks of the trip two or three weeks whatever it was so he bought came on he's got himself he's got maybe a couple changes of clothes and he's got this little parcel thing of cheese and crackers and that's what he's gonna live on for three weeks till he gets to America but he's just happy he's coming to America so he has he has his ticket and he's coming to America he's on the boat and he's coming and he's coming and first day he eats his cheese and crackers second day he eats his cheese and crackers this goes on for three or four days five days a week I don't know and then he hears this thing down the running down the hall and he smells something and it smells like lobster he smells he opens his door sees these guys you know porters waiters pushing these carts down the hall and it's got all this food on it and they knock on the door and they give it to the customers and he uh, that's just a temptation I just I would be nice to have lobster but you know I'm just gonna do my cheese and crackers so he eats his cheese and crackers a couple more days and he smells steak and he smells chicken and he smells all this wonderful food that all these other people are eating and it's just killing him because all he's got is cheese and crackers so finally he can't take it anymore he gets <laughs> gets out of his cabin and he goes and finds the captain and says captain I'll do anything I'll swab the decks I'll clean the toilets I'll wash dishes I'll do anything just give me some real food and the captain looked at him and said you got a ticket don't you he goes yeah, I, I, yeah of course it's right here he, captain goes the meals come with the ticket and we go through this whole life that we get to go to heaven and we have eternal life ticket but we don't realize that we have all the benefits of life here already unwrap the death ties and set him free we're to love and help others and to be set free to walk and to live in the new life in Christ and God gives us time to work on those things so be patient some habits are a long time ingrained in us and it takes a long time to get them out there's no excuse for not working on them but there's no excuse to judge either let's pray father thank you so much that you gave us everything in Christ that we have life to survive here we have life to go forward we have the power to live for you that you love us and everything you do is done out of love so help us to see your love in the good times and in the bad in the good experiences and in the rotten experiences help us to see your footprint help us to see your presence and Lord help us to untie the things that keep us from living hundred percent for you and we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is the benediction. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you.
Have a great week. Have a great week. Have a great week. <laughs> Keeps turning my mic off. <laughs>